Sepsis is a phenomena that occurs most commonly in cases of infections, when an individual's immune system goes overboard and there is a dangerous and exaggerated response to infection. It's an important concept in medicine because patients who are septic have an increased chance of dying of the disease, so we take pains to identify patients with sepsis and initiate treatment immediately upon recognizing the signs. Hey guys, my name is Atif Shanawaz. I am an internal medicine doctor and I make videos explaining medical concepts in an easy to understand way for layman people. Please like the video to support the channel and subscribe to the channel to get more content like it. Now today we are talking about sepsis and in this video you will understand exactly what it is, how we recognize it, how we treat it, and I think also most importantly You'll also understand that sepsis really isn't a single binary thing, but more of a spectrum of presentation. Now, when bacteria invade any part of our body, the immune system quickly recognizes the invading bacteria. And the body reacts to this by sending different kinds of white blood cells there at the site of the infection to fight the infection off. The white blood cells are a component of your blood whose main job it is to fight off infection. And while there are many different kinds of white blood cells, and one of the many things that these cells do, besides actually eating the invading bacteria, because they do that too, is that they secrete inflammatory substances that aid in the fight against the invader. Now, I'm sure that when you hear the word inflammation, you're thinking it's some bad, terrible thing that must be avoided, but in actuality, controlled inflammation is an incredibly important useful and in fact crucial process in the healing process. It's only when the inflammation gets out of control that problems arise. Now there are many, many inflammatory substances produced and the description and function of all of them will fill a book. But simply put, the role of these substances is to help clear the bacteria out of the body. One of the functions of these substances is to recruit a lot more infection-fighting cells, like white blood cells, to the area of infection. And one of the ways that this is accomplished is to cause blood vessels in the area that's infected to dilate. Now this dilation has the effect of increasing the blood supply to the area, so now more blood is reaching the area that's infected. And that's of course useful. Now, this is also the reason why areas of infection are usually swollen or congested. So if you think about infected gallbladders or the appendix, abscesses in various tissues, they're all swollen for this reason. In the same way, if a patient has pneumonia, the reason that they are so congested when they have the pneumonia is because of all of the excess blood and the fluid that's delivered there to help fight the infection. And usually what's supposed to happen is when the infection dies down, the fluid and the blood gradually return back to their normal levels and the congestion and swelling comes back down. Sepsis occurs when this process that I've just described, which is supposed to be localized only to the area of infection, becomes generalized to the whole body. So a patient with sepsis will have dilation of most of the blood vessels in their body, and this is a bad thing. Why? Well, it's a matter of fluid dynamics. Think of the circulation system like a simple plumbing system. What would happen if the entire system suddenly expanded? Well, the pressure in the fluid inside the system, in this case the blood, will drastically drop down because you've got the same amount of fluid running around in pipes that are suddenly a lot larger than they were. So low blood pressure is the most important and critical sign of sepsis because it is a clear sign that the inflammation has now become a system-wide problem. Low blood pressure will not only make the patient feel very weak and faint, but it also has the effect of making oxygen delivery to various tissues of the body a lot less efficient. This raises the risk of having those tissues be damaged in different parts of the body that were never even touched by the infection to begin with. So if cells in various parts of the body don't get oxygen that they need, they too might start to become inflamed. And that can jumpstart a vicious cycle, which explains why sepsis is so dangerous, because it can feed on itself, it can get worse and worse, and the blood pressure can get so low sometimes that cardiac arrest and death can occur. Now we use four criteria to identify sepsis and they are as follows. Number one is the low blood pressure that I just mentioned. 
Now the magic number is a systolic blood pressure of 90. And the systolic pressure is the upper number in a patient's blood pressure. So a blood pressure of say 120 over 80, which is considered normal, 120 is the systolic number. And so a number of less than 90 is considered one of the criteria for sepsis. Now, when the blood pressure is low, the heart tries its best to compensate for this by simply pumping a lot faster to keep the circulation going. So the second criteria is a high heart rate. Now, how high is high? In this case, also, we have settled on the number 90. So a heart rate of more than 90 will satisfy the definition of sepsis. Now, because sepsis can cause poor oxygen delivery, a patient might tend to be somewhat breathless. And so the third criteria is a breathing rate of greater than 22 breaths per minute. A fourth criteria is the presence of a fever of 101 degrees Fahrenheit or greater. And the reason the fever occurs is because of all of those inflammatory substances that I talked about. Now, if a patient comes in with two of these four criteria and there is some clinical evidence of an infection somewhere like pneumonia or UTI or some abscess somewhere, then they satisfy the definition of sepsis and we will begin treating them accordingly. Now, there are three important arms of treatment for patients with sepsis. And the first one is the most overlooked one, and that is early treatment. I've already explained how sepsis sometimes acts like a runaway train. So as soon as we have made the diagnosis, we must begin treatment immediately and without delay. And this is true even if we only suspect an infection that is not yet proven at the time of presentation. The key is to not delay treatment or to wait for confirmation of infection because time is of the essence here. Now, the second thing that we do promptly is that we administer IV fluids. Now, the reason for doing this should make some sense to you now because if the blood vessels are dilated, causing low blood pressure and poor oxygen delivery, what is one way that we can quickly counter this? Well, it's to pump in more fluid into this dilated circulation system in order for us to bring the blood pressure back up. So when a septic patient presents to the hospital, it is not uncommon to give two or three or four liters of IV fluids within the first one hour of diagnosis. And we will happily give more if the blood pressure doesn't come up right away. Now, the third thing that we do right away is that we start antibiotic therapy so that the infection that started this whole thing can start to die down. Now, I don't want to have people watching this video start to self-diagnose themselves with sepsis every time the heart rate goes over 90. So I need to clarify something here about the diagnostic criteria. First of all, these numbers that I mentioned are not some natural law of the universe. They're just numbers that we've collectively decided that we're going to use these criteria in order to rule in or rule out patients with sepsis. And thirdly, the code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. They are a guide. And when a patient who comes in barely meets this criteria, or if the symptoms are explained through some other reason that makes more sense, then we tend to consider that explanation as well. So for example, if a patient has a heat stroke or dehydration for some other reason, it's likely that they're gonna have a high heart rate and low blood pressure. That doesn't mean they have sepsis, which as I've explained, is a very distinct abnormality that involves inappropriate immune response to infection. For example, I've seen patients with these septic numbers who've just had bad side effects from medications or who drink too much alcohol, or they may have been on some kind of stimulant drug. There are many reasons these kind of numbers might occur. A common cold, for example, can cause a fever and a heart rate of more than 90, but that still doesn't mean that sepsis is occurring. So there has to be some degree of clinical judgment required to make sure that the septic criteria that we're using is being applied to the right kind of patient. Now, an exception to this nuance that I just described is when the sepsis criteria numbers are totally out of whack. So if a patient comes in and the heart rate is 150, the blood pressure is like 60 systolic, they have a high grade fever and they're breathing 50 times a minute. In those cases, the patient is septic will prove otherwise. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. You start treating them as septic patients because the more extreme these numbers become, the more suspicious and the more aggressive we have to become for sepsis. Because again, lives that are at risk. Now, another thing to understand is that sepsis itself can vary in its severity. Let us suppose, as an example, that a patient has sepsis with a proven source of infection. Let's, for example, say they have a UTI, but their blood pressure is almost normal. 
and they do meet the sepsis criteria because they have a fever of 101.5 and they have a respiratory rate of 23 a minute. So they do meet the definition of sepsis and yes, they should be and will be treated like a septic patient, but this kind of patient is probably not going to worry me too much. I'm pretty confident this patient will likely be okay. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, you have a patient who has such a low blood pressure that we can barely measure it. This kind of patient has a high-grade fever with a sky-high heart rate and evidence of organ damage for poor oxygen blood supply. Now, this patient is also septic, but it should be obvious that this kind of sepsis is much more serious than the first one that I described. And in fact, when we're talking about patients dying of sepsis, it is this kind of patient that I've just described that tend not to do well over time. One other factor that I always look at when determining the prognosis of a septic patient is how they feel subjectively and their mental state. What I mean is, a highly septic patient will feel absolutely awful. They'll feel really sick. They will know that something is wrong with them. Alternatively, they could just become stuporous and very poorly responsive. I tend to worry about these kind of patients as well, especially if they're older. Now, on the other hand, if a patient is feeling rough, but they're still walking around, they can still drive, they're doing their laundry, they're going shopping, and they're doing all those sorts of things, I wouldn't be too concerned about the severity of sepsis. Patients like that would still need treatment, but the fact is, if a patient is up and about and doing stuff, it is a good prognostic sign, at least in my clinical experience. Now, sepsis is a huge topic. Entire books are written about just sepsis alone, and this video is not meant to be exhaustive, but just a sort of 30,000 foot overview for layman people. So if you have any further questions on this subject, please put those down in the comments section. I would love to get back to you. As always, thank you so much for listening, and I will see you all in the next video.